Hello, I'm Nicola Caulfield. And I'm Anthony Caulfield. And we are the writers, directors, producers of the From Bedrooms to Billions film so- series. And you're listening to... The Scene World Podcast. What's up? It's the Scene World Podcast. It's the first Scene World Podcast of 2022. Uh, exactly. He's Jurg. I'm AJ. <laughs> That's yeah. us. Happy um, New Year. Happy New Year. Hope you all survived um, Christmas. Yep, and hope nobody nice. has... Hope that the instances of COVID will start going down. This is like year three of this. It's ridiculous. I mean, I mean, today they announced in German media that France yeah. discovered a new variant. Great. Great. Another one. Fantastic. <laughs> we just... Uh, they just declared a state of emergency in the state that I'm in in uh, the U.S., uh, because and they didn't want to do that, but they kind of had to because the hospital cases have gone up by five hundred percent. Yeah, I mean people people are pushing the envelope anyway. I yeah, mean people if, are if, sick if, of it, and they're if, just if if I'm looking if I'm looking on my Facebook um, po- um, friends um, posts of uh, photos from New Year's Eve. And Christmas Eve. Yep. You can imagine that it's always ten. Yes. Oh yes. Which is the maximum amount allowed since December twenties in Germany. Yep. yep. You know so what I did for New Year's? There's you know always I... there's always ten. You know. You know what I did and for New Year's? And there are people like me who say I stay alone. Yes. Because I, I, I rather I, I wouldn't sl- take the. Um, I slept through New Year's. I I went to bed at like I was asleep by like ten o'clock on New Year's Eve. I I didn't even I didn't even know it was New Year's. Mm. Good, like, good for you. Yeah. Um, like I was just yeah. like gone. I, you know, like I'm not even messing around with this nonsense. Yeah. And then of course, when there's a new variant, you get messages from friends like, "Hey, hope we have another meeting soon." And I'm like, mm, I will decide when it's about time. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, I, it's I'm a, not. I'm not sure if I'm over careful or if I'm just. I don't. Responsible. I, don't think, I think it's just responsible. Enough. I mean, we've yeah. got here in the U.S. The new guidance is that if you tested positive, you quarantine for five days and then go back to work, even if you're still positive. It used to be fourteen days. Yes, it did. Now just, just to five. remind you. Yeah. So and then now... and then they then they said seven, and then now they say five. Right, right. And it's like, uh, no, no. Yeah, but but you know this this five days um, actually was an idea from the British mm-hmm. because they said um, if if they don't do it this way and shorten it to five days. Then there will not be enough nurses and doctors right. and hospitals, not right. enough policemen. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you know what? You know why that problem is? Because they are no longer part of the EU. Uh-huh. So if you had been European city, citizen and were from abroad and worked in UK, you had to return. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a self-made issue, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'm not. I'm not happy with it. Um. The problem with this, with this, um, with this pandemic is, each country looks at what other countries are doing and thinks like, "Wow, this is great. Let's do it ourselves." And then we all get sick. So, so yeah, I'm... for for the first time, for the first time, people are looking at Africa and saying like, "Oh, in Africa, it's not so, such a big deal." So. Hopefully, it's not such a big deal in in Germany or Europe or America either. I'm like, yeah, now suddenly uh, Africa is take, taken as a role model. And yeah, right. Before right. the pandemic, nobody. I think before you the said pandemic, but Africa doesn't cared exist. About. Yeah, Africa didn't exist before. You know. Oh well. Oh well. In a minute. Uh, getting back on nicer notes, we're starting 2022 with a bang, and we are talking to. Robert Mertzak, and for and a that's, background... That's a person, a lot of listeners sent us emails, comments on the YouTube video, even yep. Roy Schiltz said himself, yes, yes. we have to talk to Robert Mertzak, and now yes. we did. Yes. 
Yeah. He did not contact us. We contacted him. Yeah, and well, he, you're, it's, you're it's pretty hard him. to get in touch with him because he has no public email address. He has no social media. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that wasn't easy. Yeah. So, but before we do that, we got a little bit of news uh, to go over. Um, so I think uh, we got to talk about the uh, the elephant in the room, or or more 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 accurately, the the hedgehog in the room, which is Sonic the motherfucking hedgehog on C sixty four. Was didn't released. play it yet. I'm still oh, you really? To... No, um, I wanted, but then I got sick over Christmas and oh. my ears got blocked. Okay. So it's and, it's good. And, and um, then then I still have to find my RAM expansion unit. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's 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 good. It's not the same as so a couple of years back there was a conversion of um Super Mario Brothers for the 64 and that is like a 1-1 one, one conversion mm, like No, no, it was Super Mario Bros. The Brothers is said. the arcade game. No, no, yeah, but also, <laughs> it's still different. No, 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 no. No, no, no. The thing that you're talking about is just Mario Brothers. Super Mario Brothers was the was the was the the platform. So there's really difference between Super and not Super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The regular Mario Brothers was that thing where you're running around kicking like porcupines or something off of platforms, and it's just one screen. Oh yeah. Okay, Mario Bros. But in both cases, it's not called Brothers. It's called Pros, which right. I know is an abbreviation of Brothers. Right. Right. Yes. And the NES game was Super Mario Bros. Right. But there was also a Game and Watch release of Super Mario Bros. Yeah, it was also so, on. Uh, <laughs> it was also on the uh, the Virtual Boy. Yeah. And, and there was also Super Mario Brothers Three had a small a version of that in there as well that you could play. Right. So, so you are talking about the NES. NES yes, I'm release. talking about the NES release. Super Mario Bros. Super Mario Brothers. Um, um, and there was a, and that was kind of like a one-to-one conversion, like, like in certain instances, the computer would slow down. Like you really wanted either a RAM, uh, not a RAM expansion, but a, um, uh, an accelerator or a 128 where you could use the two megahertz mode, um, to really get the most out of it. Um, and the music is like you know one to one sounds exactly the same. In fact, you're, it's recommended you have two SIDs. You know, um, the Sonic is not like that in that it's not a one one like like the music is. It is the Sonic music, but you can tell that it was done on it's C six. You can tell it's C sixty four music. It does not sound like. The Sega Master System. Right, it's a recreation of the game. Right, exactly. But it's interesting that you mention it because I wasn't intentioning to mention it because I put it in the news last time. Okay. I made an extra recording clip yeah, right, just right. to talk about the news. But yeah. meanwhile, they released version 1.2 to right. fix some issues. Yeah. But it's. Uh, so but it's, as I said, I had, some health, I had some health issues, so yeah. I concentrated on getting my ears fixed. Yeah, well, I I've played it a bit, and it's actually it's it's very well done. It's very nicely done. Um, well, the graphics are from Oliver Lindo. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and and again, there's some there's some bits where you can kind of you know like there's, you know, when you run into the stage, you can you can see okay, this is multicolor. It's fat pixels. It's not what the the you know the Sega Master System looked like. But other than that, you know, it's a good port. It's a it's a very well done port. Mm -hmm. Unlike the 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 um, Mario Brothers, which I believe was like they they recompiled that for the sixty four, like the code like was was rebuilt. Exactly, and and they yeah. were not the first ones doing that. It has been done years before on yeah. the me on the Mega Drive. Right, right, right. And that is where that idea came from, I believe. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, hey, AJ here, real quick. Um, one bit of news that we forgot to uh, include in when Jurg and I were talking was that uh, Pedro Planas, who we spoke to back on episode ninety six in September of twenty twenty, um, has been uploading videos to his YouTube channel. He's got a couple of new ones, uh, and there is is one that's been doing really well. Um, and uh, 
So you should definitely check him out. Uh, he is at uh, pedrovgm.bandcamp.com, and there will be a link in the podcast description to um, one of his videos. So check that out as well. Other news that we've got is that um, currently, right now, this moment, as we speak, the Mega 65 is available for pre-order at trends.org. At the, it's the Trends Electronic Web Shop. Um, mm, now, this nice. was announced at the end of last year, and they said delivery for the production units is estimated for between quarter four, 2021, and quarter one, 2022, which is right now. So, nice. Right. So some people may have already gotten it. Um, mm, I doubt it. I don't know. I don't know. But, but you, it's available for pre-order. It costs... Um, 666 pounds and and or no euros euros I'm sorry 666 yeah. euros and 66 whatever this the 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 what what's the what's the cent version in euros cent so oh they're cents yeah. oh okay okay well, I, I didn't know that um yeah so 666 euros and 66 cents um which is about 742 US dollars which is not bad. We were we were thinking that it was going to be over a $1000, but 742 is I mean, it's a, it's a bit rich for me, but mm. maybe, you know. Mm. Maybe someone will send me a demo unit. <clears throat> mm. <laughs> Mega 65 guys we talked to three times. Um two times, but never mind. Two times, whatever. Um but yeah, so that's avail- that's now um I guess I guess being shipped or just, uh, you can still order. I don't know if it's a pre-order anymore, but it's just ordering. And again, it's available at trends.org/mega65. Well, if it's not in pre-order, I guess it's an order. Yeah. Uh, that's trends.org/mega65. Um and nice. finally, the last piece of news that I the last piece of news that I say, that's not a that's not the way it works. The last bit of news that I've got is um that on January 1st of, of 2022, uh, Misty Tech released uh, the new episode of their Lost Art series. Hmm. Misty Tech, who we spoke to, I don't know when. Um, that must have been years ago. No, it wasn't years ago. I think Last it was like year? A, I think it was like a year ago or maybe two years ago. I don't know. Um, but, Probably yeah. last year. <laughs> yeah, but it, that's, that's on YouTube. Um, and... If you watch it, y'all, you you might hear a familiar voice in two lines. I have two lines of dialogue. That other big project with tons yes. of people involved. Yes, yes, yes. I have I have two lines of dialogue in this episode. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and I I also did some audio editing for this episode. So, that was nice, cool. nice. Yeah, that was fun to do. Nice, nice. Anyway, so that episode yeah. is out now, so people can check that out. We'll put a link in the podcast <laughs> description to where you can look at that. Uh, we went off the rail a bit. Shh, no one needs to know that. <laughs> um, I guess we will remove most of that bit anyway, because yeah, nobody yeah. is listening half an hour about yeah. video we, and audio editing. We, 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 yeah, Jur- Jur- Jurg and I went off on, on sort of a tangent there, just between the two of us, on, on just the, the fundamentals of audio recording and... and and but I mean, it, it, I mean I, I'm, it's not going to be in this because nobody wants to hear it because it's just long winded and 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 nice. yes and and all that. But you know, it's it's and this intro would be um what like thirty six minutes, so yeah yeah so um yeah we do this a lot by the way in that we 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 often go off the rails in our intros and it just gets cut right. for time. So, but, but maybe to, someday. But, but today, but today we didn't cut it for time. But well, no, it's just because it was irrelevant and it's and it's just random. But um, but yeah, I I mean maybe someday we'll assemble all of our uh, all of our uh, sidetrack loopers nonsense <laughs> and put them together into a uh, into one long long eight hour podcast. But we're not going to do that today. We're going to go and we're going to talk to. Do you have any news? Not really. You are no. fine. Okay, you shook your head, and that works well in the audio medium that we're currently recording in. <laughs> um, Isn't that nice? Yes, yeah. he, he does not have any, so we're going to go and talk to...
Robert Merksack right now. Well, I'll let you guys lead the talking. Um, mm -hmm. You can sure. ask me uh, pretty much almost any question you want. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll give you answers to the best of my recollection because some of the material goes back more than 20 years. <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. Well, so today, AJ and I are meeting with another guest in a new year, and this time it's Robert Mersek. Hello, Robert. Hey. Nice Hello. to have Welcome. you here. Hello. Thank you for uh, having me here. So you are known mostly for having been at Twin Galaxies and being the head of the referees, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, I had um, I worked at TG starting in I'd say it was April of 2001 as a contributing editor, uh, and then I became had a chief referee in July of 2001, and I abdicated the position in August of 2005, and I accepted a lower level position of senior referee starting with September 05, and I kept that position through December 19th of 06. Well, uh, before Christmas, Robert and I, we had a little talk, and you, you already know that we had a lot of interviews with a lot of other figures from Twin Galaxies, uh, old, new, and so on, and many readers and even people involved in Twin Galaxies themselves, they all asked, when are you going to talk to Robert? <laughs> Though, this day is now. Yeah. Oh, well, well here I am. Um, <laughs> I understand from your first conversation with me, you wanted to have a balanced perspective. So yes. you were talking to pretty much everyone that had uh, something to say regarding the uh, various actions that took place during the filming. Right. Exactly. And as you know, uh, people were concerned that we would take sides, but no, we don't. So that's rest assured. Um, I, I would like to know, Robert, as we ask all our guests, how did it start that you gained interest into arcades and all those game stuff? I mean, well, it didn't fall from the sky one day, no, I guess. Um, I started gaming well before TG was in existence. Um, I started gaming in 1969 um, when I was around, I'd say, the age of five. My parents took us, my sister and I, to a small adventure park nearby where uh, I used to live. I think it's in Whitestone, Queens. It was called, um, oh, geez, uh, what the hell was that place called? Uh, but Adventure is in. And um, you can actually find it if you do, do a Google search of Adventure is in and Queens. It's a defunct park. And they had... Um, an area that was a large area to repose yourself at. Half the area was an arcade, and half the area was for refreshments. And the arcade had, for the first time I ever saw these things, arcade machines. It had the redemption machines. Uh, it also had the electromechanicals, a lot of them. And it had a couple of full-scale arcade machines. So for the first time, I was playing in 1969, I was playing those games where... You put your uh, quarter in, and in some cases it was a dime. They still had some of the really old <laughs> ones. And um, in those early days, uh, I was able to play the uh, driving games where you control a car that was physically on the screen. It was some some cases a half the car, and you either made it go around the circle over and over again, an oval track, or you just had it driving straight ahead, and the road was effectively uh, pipe cleaners outlining the road on a cylinder. And as you pressed on the gas pedal, it would make the cylinder go faster, giving you the illusion of speed. Mm -hmm. So I got um, interested in electromechanical gaming first. And then as the years progressed, I started to see things like Pong and Breakout and games like that. And little by little, I got more exposed to the uh, what you would call the monochrome era of arcade games. And then by 1979, that's when I started to see some of the color games, the full color games like Galaxian. And that's when my interest really started to climb. 
So, so the um, hobby you had as a child from this park um, consisted and kept on even in your adulthood. When yeah, you when, when I, you were no longer a kid. Yeah, when I, when I was a, a kid, I wasn't going for high scores or anything like that. I was thrilled just to be able to play the games. Uh, the only time I ever actually took notice of my skill was when the uh, VCS system came out, the old Atari VCS system. In the Sears and Roebuck's local to my neighborhood, they had it on display, uh, the old Sears system, and you were able to play Pong. And when my parents were shopping, I was left there along with all the other kids, and we would play Pong uh, for a couple of hours each day as our parents shopped. And that's one of the things I greatly look forward to. That was my first experience with console gaming. And it just started as um, something to look forward to do on either family trips or family shopping excursions. And eventually, uh, it became something to do both at home and the few times where I visited an arcade that actually had the machines. It became a hobby. Wow. Well, you are so lucky to, to, to be in an environment where your family is open-minded enough about games and computers. I mean, when I talk to a lot of pioneers that, um, like Chuck Paddle, who did the first um, affordable microprocessor, he said people in the late 60s, early 70s, and even late 70s were afraid that computers would um, take jobs away and arcade machines would spoil the kids, you know. So well, the general perspective was not so positive in many areas. In my area, there were news reports of so-called health experts. They were warning parents that their kids could develop space invaders wrist or Pac-Man <laughs> elbow, uh, which was overstated. Um, but in my case, um, my parents weren't exactly supportive of my thrill of playing these games because uh, in my first year of high school, we had the, the very first parent-teacher's night. And instead of going to parent-teacher's night on time, I was more concerned with finishing my game of Atari 2600 Space Invaders, <laughs> which totally ticked off my father because we ended up showing up about, I'd say, with a half an hour to go, and we had to see three teachers in 30 minutes. He wasn't thrilled about that. So they got an early indication that, well, it was something that I uh, found enjoyment in. It was also something that I could let overwhelm me in, in terms of uh, focusing on what had to be done versus what I like to do. So how did it go on? How did it develop? Um, fast forward. You want me to start about what now? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, what were the next steps? I mean, well, I guess I mean, after, from, after uh, from, that, from enjoying games as, as your child, it, it wasn't like someday you, you heard about Twin Galaxies and then you became their head of no. referee. What, what happened between then? Initially, in the uh, late 70s, this was my high school uh, range, um, my friends and I in high school all became interested in arcade games. By then, electromechanicals largely were a tiny portion of the average arcade in Manhattan, um, and as well as our local no neighborhoods, which almost had no electromechanicals. So we got good at the arcade games, and then eventually when the Atari system came out, the home console stuff, um, that is all before Twin Galaxies came into being. Twin Galaxies was, I'd say, it made its appearance during my final year in high school. But I had no idea of Twin, what Twin Galaxies was until around 1983 when the electronic Gaming Monthly magazine came out, along with two or three other gaming-related magazines, and there happened to be in it, at the far end of the magazine, a scoreboard, which listed, for the first time, scores on these various games that my friends and I had been playing, and it never occurred to us until that time that there was a way to gauge how well you did against people all across the globe. We didn't even know that such an entity existed. Um, and then at some point, uh, I decided in um, 
late 1983 when I got a magazine that had uh, a score in it on one of the titles that I found interesting. Interesting. I decided in January of '84 to submit a score on uh, a Star Wars game, and uh, it took about two days to do it. And uh, that was my first and only submission to TG. Uh, it got ratified somewhere in the middle of 2000 in uh, 1984. I got a call from Walter Day and Steve Harris in summertime after my uh, senior year uh, no sorry after the, the um, session in school ended I spoke to both of them I'd say for at least an hour an hour and a half if not more and then at, at some point after that I saw my name appear in an EGM issue in the uh, scoreboard section and that was the last I dealt with TG until oh, I'd say 1997 in between 84 and 97 I was largely gaming either in the arcade with my friends or once 87 came, it was mostly home via home console gaming. And uh, it was just gaming for myself and no one else. And then someone told me that there was a world record book out there published by this Twin Galaxies organization. And I picked it up in a, uh, at the time, a Barnes & Noble store. And uh, I decided to introduce myself over the phone to... Walter, who was running TG at the time, and um, shortly after that, this was in the uh, late 90s, I'd say within a year or two after that, Fun Spot had its first live competition on classic arcade games, and that's the first time I actually got to meet some of the world record holders and fellow gamers. Before awesome. that point, I, I was only... Um, dealing with my local friends. I never traveled anywhere to competitively play games outside of my home city of New York. I never bothered to travel to play. Um, I played in the Space Invaders competition in Manhattan back on the Atari 2600. In the, I think it was 1980 or 81. That was about it. Otherwise, I didn't compete in any competitions, unlike some of the other gamers who were... Um, already dealing with TG on a regular basis. So, so how was your first impression with Train Galaxies? Well, back then, it was very, it was still very grassroots, um, more than it was in the 80s, from what I'm told, because in the 80s, there were no computers to log in and see what scores were. You had to call up Walter and find out, as I understand it. But in the early, um, in the late um, 90s, TG's website was very different than it is right now. It was mostly a forum, and um, there was some scores in the database, uh, mostly from the first book of records that Walter published, and newer scores were entered at a very uh, sparse rate because they didn't exactly have a very energetic staff back then to focus on these things. But once uh, I'd say 99 came and the fun spot events started to uh, appear on a regular basis every year, that's when the scores started to increase on the website. My first impression of TG was that it was very difficult to deal with because the staff back in 1999 was mostly Walter's friends from his dome. That's the place he goes to to med meditate. Mm -hmm. And they really didn't know what they were doing. They were there kind of just to fulfill roles, but they really weren't doing it that well. So really it was just Walter and one or two referees that I was familiar with back then and not much else. So I mostly dealt with TG back in the early days from a forum perspective and while I was competing on the Atari 2600 platform. But that was about it. Awesome. So you kind of improved all this with you stepping in. I tried to. Um, around um, July of 2001, when I was appointed chief referee, that was after I independently ran with Walter's permission uh, the Summer Console Championships of 2001. Myself and three other people ran it uh, across multiple titles. And uh, we decided uh, that um, 
you know, it might be something that I'd be interested in doing on a regular basis. I was approached by Walter and another uh, staff member at the time, and they asked me if I would be willing to uh, step in and operate in an administrative capacity, and I agreed to it. And uh, I accepted that role in mid-2001. Um, I started my approach by formalizing some of the rules that were never actually in writing before. They were pretty much word-of-mouth rules, such as the leeching policy, uh, which is also known as hunting or point scrapping. Um, I also improved the rules on the score challenge policy, the marathoning policy, and a couple of other things that until that point did not exist in Twin Galaxies um, formally. It was only uh, word of mouth. I instituted a hierarchy of referees, each with different levels of responsibility. And over time, I instituted towards the tail end of my uh, tenure as chief referee, I set up Twin Galaxies South America, which started with uh, four players known as the Metroid team, who originally started representing Twin Galaxies in the Brazil area. And in short order, we started to get a presence in local Brazil gaming magazines. So that was some of the stuff that I did during my tenure as chief referee. Well, that's super interesting because all all those people we talked to before never mentioned um, um, never mentioned Brazil before, you know. But but AJ and I and some of our other um, well staff members we talked a lot about the Brazilian video game industry. So we were never aware that even arcades did we do Brazil was thing covered. We did yeah, you... Tech Toy. Oh, Twice. that's right. That's right. Yeah, Tech Toy. Yeah. yeah. The, the Brazilian division of Twin Galaxies was short-lived because after I left Twin Galaxies, Pete Bouvier took over, and he mandated that all referees had to sign a certain uh, document, a non-disclosure document, and um, the, the uh, terms of the document were unacceptable to a lot of the referees at the time. So the entire Twin Galaxies South America team of players, they just decided we're not going to continue doing that. So they were no longer part of TG. I had a referee at large in Australia. He also decided not to sign that document. And there was a few others throughout the globe that just didn't want to continue. So a lot of the stuff that I set in motion was um, aborted by – the succession in management. Mm. Oh, that's so sad. That's so sad somehow. It, it happened. What can I do? I was no longer part of TG about it, so it wasn't anything I had any control over. It also kind of well, follows the uh, the framework of Twin Galaxies as we've grown to know them. Well, there's been a lot of different changes over the years, some good, some not so good. Mm. Um, but a lot happened after the sale to Bouvier and subsequent parties and the landscape that once was uh, Twin Galaxies had a complete overhaul. There's some elements that players like about it and there's some that they don't. A lot of the modern players, they are only accustomed to what they see now. They can't envision what it was before and in fact they frown upon the way TG operated before which was the era of the referees. There was a couple of referees that were problematic, and mm -hmm. they did some things that they quite simply shouldn't. Um, every decision I made was not well-received as well. Um, some players, you know, no matter what you did, they balked at it, um, whether it was removing scores that were either deemed not possible or closing out a previously accepted score category. There were always a couple of players that had negative responses to that. And you can't do everything to please every player at every time. But um, sometimes the players that had the negative comments were also the players that had the loudest comments. And that's why today a lot of the players that complain about what's collectively called old TG, they are very, very vocal about against old TG. They just don't like mm. it. 
Um, now the thing is, I totally forgot, unfortunately, the first person where this um, where the scandal of failed high score started. Ah. Well, that um, the most famous person as far as a scandal of a false high score was someone named Jeffrey Yi. Uh, Jeffrey oh, Yi, really? back in 1980, I think, or 81 or 82, he was honored by the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, for getting like a 5 million point score in Pac-Man, which is absolutely impossible. And wow. he was called out on it on several occasions, one time in person, and um, subsequently via phone. And uh, that score, which was la lauded as being the uh, epitome of gaming at the time, it was one of the most bogus high scores that TG ever was aware of. But as far as TG itself and scores that TG had accepted, there was a score that was claimed on Donkey Kong of several million points by a Steve Sanders. And that score was subsequently challenged by a player of notoriety named Billy Mitchell. And that is probably the more, the second most famous uh, bogus score in TG history, hmm. not including I, I was... current scores. I was actually referring to Todd Watchers and his strength oh. score. <laughs> well, that, that score, that score was accepted by TG in the late 90s. It was claimed to have been done back in 1982. And the proof that Todd gave to TG, I never saw it because at the time that Todd Rogers submitted all of his documentation to TG in the late 90s, I wasn't even a TG staffer. I was just a gamer, just like Todd was. So whatever documentation he submitted, it was accepted by the referee in charge of the Atari 2600 platform at the time. It's, it's yeah. all a bit strange. Um, but uh, but um, the way you appeared in the um, King of Kong documentary movie, the DVD release. Um, it looked to me, it appeared to me like you were sitting there watching VHS tapes with recordings all day long. Well, there was a period of time when um, I was the um, chief referee and gamers would send me VHS cassettes in the mail and they would come from pretty much anywhere in the globe. I've gotten VHS tapes uh, at the time from as far away as Malaysia, and uh, I would have to watch them. And my job at the time was actually working in the same place that I'm still working at now. And I used to have a, a pretty aggressive work schedule, and I would come home sometimes at ridiculously late hours, but I would still watch videotapes. Uh, for hours a day, and I would only sleep for about, I'd say, two and a half hours a day, Monday through oh. Friday, and on the weekend, um, I slept a little less, because I was spending as much free time as I could, once I got home from work and finished my dinner, I would watch videotapes, and these were tapes that gamers sent in with potential high scores on them, or at least their highest scores, and that's what I did for quite a few years. That must be super exhausting. Oh, it was. Um, I, I really did not get much sleep for the five and a half years that I was working for Twin Galaxies. And the fact that uh, I did it for so many hours a day, I just don't have the bandwidth to do that right now. If I was still a referee, I couldn't. First, I'm older. And second, between work and home concerns, the time to do that no longer exists. So that was a moment in my time when, uh, based on what my workload is at my job and home concerns, I had the free time to do this, and that's free time I no longer have. Right. What's your take on those scandals that uh, happened at that time? I mean, you mentioned a few um, that happened during your time, but we also had 
um, another person on the podcast even twice, and that would be Roy Schild, where he said where he said that the trackball setup was wrong and all that stuff. Well, Roy Schild is one of those characters that if he was to ever write a book on the history of Twin Galaxies, he would probably deserve three chapters all to himself with all of his antics over a 30 or 40 year period. So Roy, um, before I was even part of TG, Roy was a Missile Command player. Mm -hmm. And Roy was good at Missile Command before TG knew about Roy Schild. He was a college student. And at the time, he uh, absconded a Missile Command machine from the um, the college, uh, uh, wherever the entertainment center is, the rec center they have for the kids. He uh, took it up via the uh, dorm elevator into his dorm room. Um, and he got good at Missile Command after probably a year and a half. And he attended some Guinness event. He established a, a score of around 1.4 million, uh, so they say. And then there was a, uh, an event that took place in Canada at Johnny Z's in 1985, in which a number of gamers showed up. I think it was the Iron Man event. And Roy claims to have gotten a score of 1.695 million on tournament settings at the event. But Johnny Z, who was the proprietor, Johnny had the Missile Command game there, and um, he had it locked, which means that nobody could open it up to change the settings. And anecdotal evidence, and again, I wasn't there for this, um, someone named Chris Ira, who was there, he was playing on that very same machine, and he got a score of 300,000. 300,000 is a great score at tournament settings. But uh, Chris Ira also got a score of a million on that game. And a million it would be an awesome score in tournament settings. But Chris Ira, he was never that good at Missile Command to get that high. Roy claimed he was. So Roy's claim was that he played Missile Command 16 times in that day in which he got his record. He said that the last six games were all a million. He said six of those games were a million points. And uh, on the last of those games, he called over Walter to watch it. Now, the problem here is when Roy was getting a million points in the early games by not calling over Walter, knowing that Missile Command and Tournament settings, you don't get any extra cities, and the score rolls over at a million, how do you prove to someone calling them over afterwards what your score was? And number two, how do you know how high you're going to score at the time the game rolls over? So it made no sense to us that Roy, way, way back, claims he never called over Walter for the first time he's reached a million, the first five times. But in the last time, he says he calls over Walter. And the problem there is Walter at the time was watching Chris Iris set in the world's record as I understand it, on the Ms. Pac-Man machine. So no one was really watching Roy. Roy said he got a million six ninety five. Now, it's very possible that Roy Shield got six hundred ninety five thousand and not a million six ninety five. There is no way to tell once the score rolls over. And on top of that, years later, when we had an interview with All Games Radio in February of 07 after I quit TG, Walter calls up two people. He called up Todd Rogers and Tony Temple, who was the world record holder on Missile Command right now. To one of them, he asked, what are the odds that he can watch a game and not realize that it's awarding extra cities every 10,000 points? And number two, he asked them whether or not the game makes any uh, audio confirmation that someone is getting extra cities. So Walter's recollection of what he saw or did not see was highly questionable. So it really comes down to believability. Did Roy do it? Did Roy not do it? I believe Roy Schilt is a skilled player, but it's questionable whether he truly got a million six ninety five and not just six hundred ninety five thousand. And then the issue of the trackball, TG at some point in two thousand five or so or two thousand six. Walter instructed senior referee Kelly Fluin from Canada, who was um, 
one of the referees I brought onto TG to spruce up the TG database and to append PDF files of all of the operator manuals with the rule settings. And um, Kelly for Missile Command, he downloaded something he found on the internet, but he didn't realize that there were different versions of the, the operator's manual at the time. There were some versions that had a certain dip switch setting set in one position, and in other manuals that had it set in another position. Right. What Roy Schilt, upon seeing that for the first time in the TG database, the Tony Temple had already gotten the world's record at that point. Roy Schilt starts to say that he was playing at a different trackball setting. And at no point in TG history did Roy <laughs> Schilt ever bring this up from 1985 wow. all the way up until 2005. He never mentioned it in 20 years. And in fact, the uh, uh, Guinness manuals from the Guinness Masters events from 1984 and 85 and 86, if you look at the copies of those, and uh, I donated two of them to FunSpot, if you look at the copies, it doesn't have any provisions that specified for that trackball setting that it had to be in the position that Roy Schilt said it should be in. Basically, the position was it's a, it was a non-issue. So Roy Schilt was basically jumping on a mistake that was made in the TG database by appending the uh, trackball settings, and the wrong manual was used to do so. So Roy was jumping all over that, claiming that his world record was at a more difficult setting. And he kept on that from 2005 all the way through present day, if you was to ask him. He even has a oh, website, oh, we did. .com, and it says on there that the trackball setting is wrong. To his dying day, Roy is going to maintain that that's not the right settings for Missile Command. And he has no proof whatsoever that that's what he played on all those years ago. So it comes down to that you can't know until you have been there and opened the machine, which nobody right. did, it's, it's, because he said correct. the machine was locked. It's simply so, it's just correct. unverifiable. He may, he may have gotten a score, he may not have. Nobody can nobody can tell. Yeah, and and Roy Schild, back in the day that I was still a referee, Roy had a story from start to end of that contest, and we would the rep, my fellow referees and I would plug away at elements of his story. That were false. Every time we did that, Roy would change his story. For example, one of the elements that Roy Schilt said was that two gamers, Chris Ira and Darren Harris, were both there to watch his game. And the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> and Roy didn't know this when he said that, Darren Harris actually saved his bus tickets from 1985 to prove that he and Chris were there at two different times. <laughs> one came, the other one left. So they couldn't both have seen Roy score at the same time. It was physically impossible. So Roy's story from 1985 kept changing to the point where eventually he asked Walter and I to take the dates out attributed to his score because there was no way he could prove even the dates. Everything he had made up about 1985 at that event was wrong. He's a great player. But I don't know if he got a million six ninety five, hmm. and I also don't know if he played on the settings that he said he did. Now I wonder. You talked about twenty oh five. So why? I, I just want to those... point out really quick yeah. before because yeah. you know if if anyone listened to our Roy Schilt interview, um, two um, interviews. Yes, actually. the two interviews that we did with him. Robert Mertzak did not contact either of us, <laughs> uh, and and I I was waiting for it. I was hoping. I was hoping. I'm like I'm like ah oh, it would be so cool if this if this actually turned out to be to be right and and Robert was like you know on a on a vendetta to destroy him or something and he actually called me but nobody called me no honestly, no I'm... honestly I didn't know you guys existed until you <laughs> contacted me I, I just really didn't know yeah. yeah yeah and 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 um I I also noticed you weren't easy to find. But I found you in the current Twin Galaxies forum, and yeah, I was like, uh, "That could be him." And I just, I just messaged you on the forum's message board just by chance, you know. 
Yeah, I, that, was, that was I wasn't even I sure if if it's the real if it's a real Robert Merce, like, but no, it was. It's, it's me. It's it's my initials. It's me. I've been using them ever since I was starting out entering initials in video game scores. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So you weren't easy to find. So um, and and I kept and I well, well not a problem. And I kept emailing you for for a couple of weeks. So it wasn't easy yeah. <laughs> to to get to you. So just to to uh, uh, to make that clear, and um, and and the main problem that we had, um, and I mentioned that also when when Robert and I talked before Christmas briefly, that when the scandal with Todd Rogers happened, nobody wanted to talk to us for two years. Yeah, yeah. You know what happened was between the King of Kong. Uh, movie uh, and chasing ghosts between those two and some of recent events involving Billy Mitchell and Roy yeah, Schilt. Yeah, yeah. A lot of gamers are reluctant to give interviews for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. uh, especially if um, the subject matter is going to include Billy and Todd because of pending litigation. Yeah. But as far as King of Kong and chasing ghosts, we were filmed in as far back as 2004 through 2005 for both films. And the premise under which we were filmed ended up being different than the actual film product. So we were misled yeah, on all counts. This is a thing that I've said for a while, which is that, that the King of Kong movie was isn't so much a documentary as it is a movie. Correct. There's like a last minute thing where, you know, it's the, the one, you know, someone's going to upend Billy's score and then at the last minute, Billy, you know, takes it over there, again or whatever. There, and it's a like, couple of, there's a couple of stories that are going around about King of Kong. Most people hear that gamers were filmed at Fun Spot for the King of Kong and that some addendum footage was added uh, based on subsequent events that took place. Right. But the reality is, when we were first being filmed, we did not know that we were being filmed for what turned out to be King of Kong. Hmm. The producers, um, Mike Verrecchia and Lincoln, Ver, Link, Mike Verruc Verrecchia and Lincoln Ruckty, the producer and director, they told us they were putting together a gaming documentary based on gamers from yesteryear. And what they, you know, what they thought about how gaming has progressed oh. over the last 20 years or so since we last started gaming and our perspectives now and any anecdotes we wish to share. But they say it morphed into King of Kong. That's one story. Another story is that there was definite courses of action that took place beforehand involving some of the people in, with King of Kong. And they had every um, indications up front that they were going to make a story involving Billy versus Steve. And the only way they can get the other people to be on board is through deception. Mm -hmm. So while we were filmed um, under one premise, auspice, when the time came for them to lock into production, towards the uh, end of 2006 in November – Walter Day contacted a number of gamers, including myself, who were filmed, and he was pressuring us to sign an NDA that would be mailed to us, to sign it right away, because it had to be done for the film. What Walter didn't tell us is at the time, he knew damn well exactly what that film was going to be about. He didn't share that with us. So when we signed our NDAs, we did not know Roy Schilt was going to be in the film. And we did not know it was going to be a Billy versus Steve film. So we were deceived. Yeah. And Most now, now all those years later, you're, you're not caring about the NDA anymore. You dropped the bump. Well, the thing with the NDA that was signed, it basically said that they can use our footage for that purpose or any other purpose, which is why we don't sign NDAs anymore, mm -hmm. because they could effectively take anything we said and use it for a dog food commercial, and there's not a thing we could say about it. Right. It also gave them the right to use anything that they said uh, that we said in perpetuity. But what they also did, which nobody knows about, you would have to watch the King of Kong credits for this. 
there is a series of uh, videos that was taken by one of the three documentary film crews back at Fun Spot in the 2004 to 2005 range. And Josh Tuttle or Ross Tuttle, I forget his name, he filmed me in my office, among other places. And there's a scene in King of Kong where I'm talking about the gummy substance. I'm sitting at a computer desk, um, looking at a computer screen, I'm talking to someone. That film footage was not shot by the King of Kong crew. They bought it from one of the other documentary filmmakers because it contained something that they could intersperse into their crafted storyline to make it sound more believable. So King of Kong, like you said earlier, it was not really a documentary, it's a film. That's entirely correct. But there's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff that happened that no one's really, no one's really aware of. And that's just one of the little pieces. I mean, it, it, won, it won awards at that time for being a documentary of the year and stuff, you know? So it was very successful as a movie or documentary. The, may you see it how you, how you want to see it it. It, it? it had a compelling storyline, I agree. But there's a lot of factual errors throughout the film. Uh, I don't remember, did I send you, uh, your the... Uh, King of Kong annotations and documentation that I uh, crafted back in the day. I don't remember if I Not did. yet. Not yet. No. Well, there's, there's quite a bit. Um, I've personally reviewed for Walter at the time. I reviewed the entire movie and minute by minute, second by second, I mapped out what's true, what's not true. And the movie is just rife with errors. If you look at the Pompano Beach event all by itself, There's at one point when Steve is playing his last game, there's like eight errors inside of 60 seconds. It's all continuity errors, and they were just slapping together one scene after another just to give you the illusion that Steve is having a tough final game. But it was really just bits and pieces of other performances. Uh, when it comes to um, whether the film portrays in truth what happened, it really doesn't 100%. I'd say it's 80% true and 20% crafted information. Yeah, they got to build a compelling storyline. But they won an award for it. Yeah. And now there's this thing um, that uh, Billy Mitchell always claims he never saw the movie. Do you oh, think geez. he never saw the movie? <laughs> he watches I, I don't, it every day. I don't day. believe a word that comes out of that man's mouth. <laughs> We described, Dwayne, myself, and others described so much of that movie to him, even if he didn't see it. <laughs> It's like if a blind man doesn't see a movie but listens to it. Technically, he's still seen the movie. He can visualize it from everything he's yeah. heard. If you read the book of the movie, you didn't see the movie, but you know what it's about. Billy heard every relevant moment from that movie that there was regarding him. So he may, he may say that he never saw the movie. But Billy, Billy tells half-truths. Billy might have seen clips of it. But in Billy's mind, when he says he didn't see the movie, that means he didn't watch it from start to yeah. finish. He could very well have seen a scene here and a scene there and a scene there. But in his mind, he's not lying when he says he didn't watch the movie because he didn't watch the whole movie. Uh, I can't, I can't so see him really not watching to... it. The guy is so, is so – Full of Billy Mitchell yeah. that I, I it's like I, I imagine yeah. that's like like every Christmas we all sit down and watch this movie. You ha you have to take everything he says with a <laughs> grain of salt. It's like he says that he doesn't like the movie, but he opens up an arcade in a Florida airport using the King of Kong poster to welcome everyone into the arcade. So who is he kidding? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The the thing is, the thing is with Twin Galaxies, new and old. There are so many sides taken place by so many actors and um, people involved that it's um, really hard to tell where the truth really really lies. And um, we just try to be independent and yeah. get as much sides of the story as possible. But there will never be. Uh, um, a definite truth only to those who really relived it back then and were present when it happened. I, I heard 
and again, I, I, I was not there at the inception of the decision making process for how to, you know, King of Kong was to be made. I've heard that even before we were filmed, that there were pre discussions that took place involving Steve Weeb, Steve Weeby's best friend in the film, the director and the producer, and possibly Walter and Billy. I have no way to prove this. I've only heard it because by the time the filming started, I will say this. We were set up to say certain things at certain times in a certain way. For example, there's a scene in King of Kong where I'm talking about how we have to send in the pros to certain things. And the movie used that to segue into the uh, discussion of gamers going into Steve Weeby's garage, portraying them as breaking uh, in. But uh, what you don't, but what you don't know, because it was filmed three times in a row until I said it just the way they liked it. This was when they were discussing how I received Steve Weeby's tapes of his 985,000 performance on tape, which is higher than anything's ever been done at the time. And I had no choice but to send it in to the pros, which in this case was Chris Ira, who was a pro at Donkey Kong. Because I couldn't very well send it to Billy to watch it. Billy was a competitor. Right. So they used me saying that. But they had me say that same thing three different ways until they settled on what they felt was the best way to incorporate it into their story. Because whatever the first two ways I said it, it didn't sound, I guess, as sinister enough hmm. as the last way that I said it because they were making it sound like Walter and I set this whole thing up. But the reality, and the movie doesn't tell you this, is that Brian Koo, who was one of the people in the movie, Brian took a vacation to go to visit Ground Control Arcade in Portland, Oregon, where Bill Carlton well, was a Missile Command and Asteroids player uh, to watch him. And then from there... He went to Seattle to meet Perry Rogers, who was the former Galaxian champion, and the two of them went to visit Steve Wiebe. And this was basically Brian Koo's vacation. But the movie makes it sound like Twin Galaxies sent in the pros to invade Steve Wiebe's garage, when that is not the case. Exactly. It was very portrayed, very traumatic, and his wife was totally portrayed as being helpless. Oh, his wife is a drama queen. <laughs> she just she deserves an award for all that fake stuff she was saying. She really does. So I don't know if you saw the movie. I did AJ, not see the but, movie. Uh, I have not seen it. You did not yeah. see. So that's something you should order yeah, on I Amazon. Should, probably. You can still get it yeah. from there. You should. It's a totally um, a very entertaining movie, and it was actually the reason for me to get in touch with with Walter Day and all those others. Um, but here, here's the thing. I I wonder um, um, why is that that currently Chase Hall, the current owner of Twin Galaxies, and his crew, they are not doing interviews. They are not talking well, to reason, anybody. There's a reason for that. Chase Hall and the rest of his TG staffers, TG and Chase Hall, are involved with a multi-million dollar lawsuit, both issued to them by Billy and issued by Twin Galaxies to Billy. So they have litigation issues. They cannot do any interviews because anything that they say in print can be used as ammunition by Billy Mitchell. Mm. So they're not going to give any interviews at this point. And who can blame them with the, with the, vol the vast amount of money that's involved? But but they they neither did 2014. So I mean that's like and we've heard also that well, seven that seven 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 eight years ago. We've also heard. Like, keep in mind, 2014 is when Twin Galaxies first relaunched. So yeah. Jace was, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and I should state, I am not empowered to speak on behalf of, of Jace or TG. Of course, I'm just sharing sure. anecdotes. Jace sure. had just recently completed the purchase of Twin Galaxies, but he had to do a lot of vetting and investigation um, because there was some discrepancies with respect to the information that was presented to him. For instance, 
he had to find out who exactly owned Twin Galaxies. As I understand it, Walter supposedly sold Twin Galaxies to Pete Bouvier for a dollar value. Now, that was, as I understand, it's supposed to be paid back within a certain period of time. Jace's investigation found out that it wasn't. He also found out that Walter, after that time expired, was not pursuing it, probably because Walter forgot. But Pete Bouvier apparently sold Twin Galaxies to some other individuals. I don't remember the exact chain of custody of who owns it. Jordan Adler might be one of the people. Richie Knuckles, a.k.a. Richie Vavrance, might be another. But there was a, another set of owners after Pete Bouvier, and they in turn were who Jace thought he was buying TG from. But they never legally owned TG in the first place. Mm. So Jace had to figure out who exactly owns Twin Galaxies because he can't very well own an entity – where the true ownership is uh, discrepant in a court of law. So he couldn't really do anything, legally speaking, on behalf of Twin Galaxies until all of that was worked out. Right. So he likely couldn't give any interviews because it wasn't official who owned TG at that point. He was still in the process of finding certain things out as being unclear. So he couldn't very well say, here I am, you know, owner of TG, when he's not owner of TG potentially. That's, good. That's, That's probably good why point. he wasn't given interviews. Mm. That's a good point, yeah. It's, it's interesting that after all those interviews we did with people before, you are telling us a lot of things that nobody ever told us before, like the South American part of, of Twin Galaxies. And, and yeah. as I said about um, the... Unsecurity or uncertain to certainty of who owned Twin Galaxies, and um, it's really, really nice and new information you're giving us here. At yeah, least there's, from, there's from a, my side. when when um, Bouvier owned it, what happened initially, and again, this is information that nobody really knows. I was a member of Twin Galaxies as um, a board of directors member and chief referee concurrent with Brian King, who was another board member and our chief technical officer, and uh, Ron Corcoran, who was another board member and a senior referee, um, we were told by Walter, and this goes back before 2004, that there was an individual that Walter said would be calling us because Walter had some grandiose ideas to turn Twin Galaxies – over to an individual who wanted to convert it into a portal site. And the individual wanted us to sell our shares in Twin Galaxies to him. Yeah. We didn't know who this individual was. It turns out it, w it was going to be Pete Bouvier. But there were plans for Pete Bouvier to buy TG as early as 2000, late 2003, early 2004. It just wasn't finalized until – late 2006 at some point. Right. Most people don't know that. Walter just does things. He at one point wanted to name Idaho as the video gaming capital of the world. Yeah. Don't ask me why, what Idaho's famous for except potatoes. I don't know. But this is what Walter used to do back then. He would throw these uh, monkey wrenches into the situation and no one knew what to make out of it. It's, it's... Coming into, into the scene was quite honestly, a shock to certain people. I don't, I don't know if it was about the same time where two dudes tried to make Twin Galaxies a paid service, where people well, actually had to pay to have an yeah, entry that in probably, the that, that probably was around the time of Jordan Adler and Richie Knuckles, and there might have been some other entity involved. But yeah, they, people wanted to turn TG into a pay, a pay service where you would actually have to pay referees to watch your performances based on the duration of them. And that was a step in the wrong direction. Thank God it didn't go through. Mm. Wow. Jeez. Wow. Wow. It's, it's, all, it's all a big, um, how do you say it, clusterfuck? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah that's, that's pretty much it. That's wow. pretty much it. Yeah, here, here's the thing. When we spoke to all the others, we 
I always had the impression they really didn't like Chase Hall and the way he is doing things. But you, on the other hand, you are you are totally neutral, at least from my well, feeling. Not, not exactly. Um, up front, I was concerned that Twin Galaxies under Jace's leadership, and this is going back to 2013, 2014, I was concerned that his focus would be on modern gaming and put classic gaming to the side. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But there was every indication that it might, based on some of the um, stuff that I was seeing that Jace was posting on the forum. It was, it was hard to ascertain where his focus was. It sounded like all his attention was being focused on modern gaming. And that, that was a concern of mine that thankfully didn't manifest. Mm. But Jace, unlike, say, Walter, Jace is a uh, business person first and foremost. And I'd say he's less gamer, more business. So some people, I guess, prefer to have that gamer in charge mentality and walter for all intent and purpose was mostly you know a gamer he was interested in the scores he played the games um he was less interested in running tg as a business so it was a shift in mindset and some people might not have appreciated that but also jace was less accessible than walter because again jace's other concerns he's running multiple companies and he can't spend 24 hours a day running tg right so it was a, a, ba a matter of getting used to it, a honeymoon period, if you will. <laughs> well, the thing is, I, I can't really say anything bad about Chase Hall because actually I didn't know any of that in 2014. So when I approached um, Twin Galaxies via email, of course, my email was sent to Chase Hall. And he helped me getting in touch with Walter Day. So I cannot say anything negative about Chase Hall. I just hope that after all this lawsuit thing and so on is over, that at some point in the future we will have an interview with Chase Hall. Finally. Yeah. This will well, be like the Holy Grail, probably. Well, I, don't, I don't know that, what we'd call that. That would probably be... Uh, that would probably be a good I think to happen for all parties considered um, once the lawsuits are over and the appeals process is finalized because in the United States uh, there is the appeals process and I guarantee that Billy's ego will not allow him to ignore the appeals process if push comes to shove so Jace is likely to keep away from interviews until Billy's appeals are exhausted Right. No, no, I just wanted to point out in this interview that I I can't say any, anything negative about Chase Hall because he pointed me into the right direction. So, um. Well, Jace, again, it, the more you know of Jace and the more you deal with Jace, the more you see it. I've got lots to say about Walter. I'll keep my tongue in check for the most part. But for Jace, we don't agree on everything. I'd say we agree on 90% of the stuff. Jason and I disagree on certain points of view. For instance, Jason's point of view on the uh, forum. He has one idea of what constitutes violation of terms of service on the forum. I have a different idea. He sees people as being uh, cyber bullies on the forum in a different way than I do. He's more of a, um, I'd say, a a uh, slow to react. I'm more of a pit bull when it comes to dealing with problem people in the forums going back to my days at TG. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to score challenges, he takes a more backseat approach than I used to as a chief referee. So we're eye to eye on most things, but not on some things. And it's not a matter of saying that Jace is not the right person. He just simply has a different perspective on things. That's all. Well, so under this mark, we can say um, he probably is not going to, well, drive Twin Galaxies to the ground. Well, I mean, he'll keep Twin Galaxies uh, to the best of his ability in the news, uh, in the media, uh, making announcements as needed. But in terms of giving interviews that may impact 
or um, give ammunition to his opponent in the litigation, that type of uh, media interview or um, media press release he will probably avoid in the coming future until, again, all litigation has been finalized. I will be ready when yeah, this yeah. happens. And you can't well, blame him either. <laughs> Of course. Well, um, AJ, you said earlier you prepared something. No, I didn't prepare anything. I just, I, just, you... I just looked up the research that I had done last time, just so I had that available if we went down that path. Okay. It, 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 was my, <laughs> it was mostly related to Twin Galaxies and, and whether they there should only be like one gatekeeper of like the high scores as there is. You know, like right now Guinness goes through Twin Galaxies to verify scores and there's been a lot of controversy uh, you know as to you know twin galaxies and how how um um impartial they are and and all that and and it's just a matter of like you know we found a, an old um an old i found an old message board forum which or, or an old for message on a forum <clears throat> which you actually chimed in on which was regarding roy which uh a bunch of his scores were taken out of the book and then were put back in under somebody else's name. Oh yeah, I took I took his scores out myself. Yeah, and then they, and then after you left, they were put back in, but under somebody else's name. And then they were put back in again, but his name was misspelled every time. Well, I had nothing to do with yeah, that. Yeah, I do remember taking his scores out, and it was one of the reasons I left TG is because Walter demanded I put them back right. in. Yeah, yeah. You actually posted on on that message board uh, saying that you remember deleting all of his scores, and that you refused to reinstate them, and that was one of the reasons that you quit. Um, and then, no idea how the the name the 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 scores were reinstated under the name Burton Millward. Which is news Which to is me. A, I mean, if somebody mentioned it to me in the past, I wouldn't even know because I had nothing to do yeah, with TG. This is back in 20, 2019, I, I guess this was posted. And, and but Burton Millward was apparently a um, a lawyer that was also a guru that practiced transcendental meditation at the same place that Walter Day did. <laughs> so, uh, well, whoever did that in twenty nineteen, I don't even know who had the authority to. Re add scores in 2019. Mm -hmm. Jace was in charge of TG at the yeah. time, and there were no no more referees. Right, right. So either someone in Twin Galaxies admins group added the scores in, or someone submitted the scores on behalf of Roy, and they were subsequently authenticated by the gamers. My guess is it had to be a TG admin person, right. but I have no way of knowing who. Because Jace only has so many admin people on staff. Right. right. So, so like, you know, so the, the question basically was, is that, you know, should something like, like Twin Galaxies be like an official gatekeeper for the scores when, when stuff like that, that happens, when things pop in, pop out, there's no, no, there's no one gives any explanation for how, how it goes and everything, well, you know, it's. Un unfortunately, the website, even in the past, was never designed in such a way that there was a historical trail maintained right. of what happened to any given score, such as if a score is removed or if it's surpassed by a higher score or if it's reclassified. There was never any audit trail maintained. It was, it's a matter of programming. But should TG be the sole gatekeeper? Well, it never had to be anyone in the first place. Walter at inception just decided to do right. it. And the data twin galaxies to be honest with you it's two things it's a database of scores and it's a forum exchange mm -hmm. and that's really what it is at the core so the database has been preserved all these years that's the core of tg um anyone technically can run a scoreboard they could take scores that they've read from other scoreboards and just compile it into one massive scoreboard or they can only take scores that they themselves have physically seen, or some combination of the two. Um, TG just happens to be a scoreboard that largely is comprised of scores that it has witnessed in one way, shape, or form, although there's some exceptions. But um, should it be doing that? Um, my, my answer would be, why not? There's nothing preventing T1 Galaxies from doing it. But should Guinness regard TG as the sole source of scores? 
That's a business decision for Guinness. It's, wow, like, Eli- it's like the Elias Sports Bureau, if you're familiar with ESB. Mm-hmm. They basically are the recognized authority on sports statistics. Um, but at, when they started it at inception doing this, did people regard them as the sole authority? Probably not. Over time, they did. And Twin Galaxies has been around for almost four, well, 40 years now. So should Twin Galaxies be regarded as a, uh, an expert on this or as a you know, recognized source? I would say it should be yes, providing they're doing it right. That would be my answer. Okay. Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole, whole chunk of information here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing how much information you can put in one hour. Honestly, yeah, really, and um, yeah, oh, I can think about this stuff for hours on end. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, of course, if you like, and um, events progressed in the future with the lawsuits and stuff, perhaps we can make a follow up at some point. At some point, sure. If if you enjoyed this, I hope you did. Um, so so from my side, from my side, I, I would have it covered. I don't know about you, yeah, AJ. I'm, I'm good. Wonderful, wonderful. Is there is is there a website? Or is there any place that people go to find out what you're doing or or no? Unfortunately, I don't have a large social media presence. I don't have a Twitter account, Instagram. I don't have a Twitch account. Um, mm-hmm. With my uh, gaming performances, I post from time to time on Facebook, and it's not really so much as an account of what I'm doing gaming wise, just stuff in general. Right, but. Um, Gaming wise, I'm really not competitively gaming anymore because events that took place over 2019 through 2021, the early part, became very toxic on the Twin Galaxies forum. And as such, to be quite honest, it sucked all the enjoyment out of competitively gaming from me. And I haven't competitively gamed for a while. Now, I haven't submitted to TG since early to mid 2020. Right. As a result. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure after we release this, there will be a lot of people cheering that we finally got you. Yes. Well, I hope so. I, I wish you guys all the very best, and I thank you for the opportunity to talk some more about the uh, hobby of gaming that I've been in for so many years and to share some of my anecdotes. Well, you have a very good reputation in, well, in the arcade scene to this day. So, Well, not to some. To, ma- to many, but not to some. <laughs> <laughs> we spoke to the, to the right people then. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Thank you for right. sitting with us. Right. No problem. <laughs> you guys have a great uh, afternoon and a happy new year ahead. Yes, indeed. Thank same you. To you. Same to you. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. 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 Bye.